Second semester is, um, in a lot of ways, the same as the first. Um, the difference kind of being, I guess, that, you know, um, maybe now you guys are a little bit more used to the, the language of organic, right? You know, we've, we've spent a lot of time kind of dealing with the mechanisms and the arrows and looking for our positives and looking for our negatives and kind of all that stuff that kind of goes together uh, with, with those concepts. And the second semester is just kind of more of that, right? Just uh, figuring out some more uh, reactions and how we can do transformations for different functional groups. The focus, I guess, or the main ideas that we're kind of going to hit in the second semester here is a little bit more on the synthesis side of things. So how can we start to string together a um, series of reactions to come up with a a new molecule or a bigger molecule or a better molecule or whatever you want to say with that, right? And so if you think back on it, uh, what we did in uh, OCHEM 1 was here is a functional group and how do we transform it into another one, right? We did a lot of these single step type of, of reactions, right? And so what we want to kind of build into at the end of this semester is now that you guys can do one reaction, can you guys do three reactions? You guys are like, no. <laughs> but, and, and so on, on paper, it sounds kind of easy, right? If I can do one, you know, if you can take one step, then you can take one step three times. But the, the idea that we have to start to pay attention to is the uh, selectivity of some of these reactions. And we started to talk about this a little bit at the end of last semester, where we discussed, you know, uh, with an alcohol that it can act as a base and an acid, right? And depending on the kind of acid you put in there, a different product comes out of it, right? Whether you use sulfuric or hydrochloric or hydrobromic and all that, right? We have a different transformation that can get affected by each of those uh, other reagents that we put in there, right? And so that's the kind of idea that we're going to play into uh, as we move through the semester, because what we're going to learn is a bunch of reactions, okay? Just a ton, right? I have this. Uh, functional group, I can transform it into this functional group. And there's going to be a lot of them. How do each of those different uh, reagents that we use in those transformations, how do they react with other functional groups that may be present? Because right? if you take a look at the top 10 most sold pharmaceuticals, for instance, right? it's not just a compound with a single functional group. Right? Very rarely is it that. So how can we uh, adapt, how can we take care of these different functional groups that actually do the transformation that we want. So that's the kind of thing to start to pay attention to, right? Always start to ask the question, what's next, right? What else could I do with this? What could this functional group that I want to make start to react with? Right, that kind of idea. And we'll start to build into that a little bit too, right? And so if you remember where we ended up last uh, semester, we also talked about the idea of protecting groups a little bit, right? And I think we talked a little bit about the protecting groups for alcohols and uh, what it actually means to be a protecting group. Right? So we'll come in and talk about those quite a bit more and just how we can add those or remove those or do something different with all those different um, uh, individual groups there. Okay? <clears throat> but where we're going to pick up, um, we're going to kind of uh, hop back into chapter 12 and uh, finish up some of the alcohol chemistry that we didn't uh, get around to. Um, just because I think it lends itself a little bit more to the second half. Uh, we um, spent quite a bit of time dealing with alcohols in the first uh, semester and, and quite a bit of time dealing with the halides 
uh, in terms of eliminations and additions and substitutions and all that kind of stuff in there. And so we're just going to kind of pick up from that exact same place and just kind of keep moving forward with it. But the first big thing that we need to talk about, um, or kind of the first big topic we're going to hit is uh, dealing with how to make um, ketones and aldehydes and some carboxylic acids. Right? So we're going to take a look at oxidations and reductions. And that's going to be important. And then we're going to kind of leave those alone. And we're going to uh, step into the realm of um, aromatics. Now, aromatics are things like benzene and some of the derivatives of benzene there. And if you remember, one of these things that I taught you guys in the first semester of organic is that benzene doesn't do anything. Right? We just left it, as, left it on its uh, pedestal there and we said we're not going to um, react or do anything with it. All right? So now we can throw all that out the window. Okay? So, ben, <laughs> so everything that I taught you, right? Uh, how much did you guys pay for this class? Right. <laughs> okay. But now we're going to come in and we're going to start to do some reactions with aromatic rings. And you'll see that actually in reality they're quite reactive under specific conditions though. Okay? So we're going to learn those conditions. We're going to learn how to do quite a bit of uh, transformation and additions and eliminations and substitutions and that kind of stuff on our benzene rings themselves. And then, um, um, and then after we go through that, which is about two-ish or so chapters, then we'll come back to carbonyl chemistry again. And pretty much the rest of the semester at that point is all carbonyl chemistry. Right? So we spend like four chapters dealing with carbonyls right? and the different derivatives of that stuff. So uh, we'll, we'll um, end up learning, uh, what is it? Let's, let's think here for just a quick second. So one, two, three, three, four, five, six, maybe about, I would say maybe about a dozen or so new mechanisms, right? So not too many new mechanisms in, in the grand scheme of things, but you guys will learn a lot of different reaction conditions. Right? So what we're going to see is kind of the same idea that we saw happen with OCHEM 1, wherein I taught you guys an SN1 mechanism, right? And I taught you guys an SN2 and an E1 and an E2. Right. Okay. But do we see those same steps that were repeated over and over again in other bigger mechanisms for different reagents and different reactions? So the same thing here. We're going to learn how carbonyls react, okay? But we're going to see that same reactivity and that same pattern happen over and over and over again in different sets of carbonyls, okay? So that's kind of how it's gonna be, right? So we have the broad, the broad picture there. We'll start with the alcohols, we'll talk about oxidations, we'll move into the aromatic chemistry, and then we'll move into the carbonyl chemistry. And then depending just kind of how far we get and you know, where we kind of end up, we might talk a little about organometallic chemistry, just kind of some of the, uh, the modern, uh, I don't know if modern is the right word, but the, let's say the uh, coupling reactions and how uh, different uh, transition metals actually do a lot of the chemistry a lot easier than what I've been teaching you guys. I'm teaching you guys the hard way to do it. It's all right, okay? If I taught you guys the easy stuff first, then the exams would be all easy. Like, oh, this is one step, I can just blow, blah, blah. And then I have to give you guys good grades, right? I don't want to do that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, right? But we'll talk a little bit about how um, transition metals uh, do some very, very unique chemistry as compared to what we've seen before. Okay. Other than that, everything's kind of going to be about the same as what we did in the first semester there. You know, we'll have a couple of exams and we'll have a couple of quizzes and this kind of stuff. Just don't get sick and then we don't have to do anything, all right? Okay, there we go, right? You know, we're all here, we all did the quizzes, we all did the makeups, all this kind of stuff. Uh, we did have a lab on Thursday, right? Um, we'll start off a little bit easy because we always got to do the safety stuff on the first day there. So we'll make soap, okay? How many of you guys have made your own soap before? Two of you guys. The rest of you guys are screwed in the apocalypse. <laughs> all right, you know. Man, all right. <laughs> so we'll make, we'll make some soap and then uh, we'll, we'll make some raspberry fragrance, I think, to go with it for the, uh, for the, uh, yeah, for the, for the second, for the second lab. Um, so we'll see. We'll see how that goes. It's, it's a new experiment, at least making the raspberry stuff there. But uh, who knows? We'll see what happens. You guys are very good at it, so <laughs> you guys. Are, 
impress me by if you're willing to make men to king, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, we'll um, we'll see how the lab goes there with that stuff. Then. But guarantee, I, I will guarantee that all of you guys will be able to make your own soap, uh, whether you actually want to use it or not is a different argument. <laughs> <laughs> but that's all good. All right, so uh, labs, and then you guys know about their names. We'll be doing a lab weeks there too. But, uh, if everything goes as planned, I'd rather have all of the exams in person rather than online stuff, just because then the exams are easier and you guys don't have, you know, you only cry for two hours instead of 20, and, you know, life is, you know, life is a little bit, life is a little bit better, right? So, but no, in-person in exams are always going to be easier, right? So, but anyway, that's it's just, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a better measure, I guess, of some things, but that's a different argument for a different day. All right? Sound good? Any immediate burning questions in? Or? Yeah? Are we going to have to, remember how to do that? Are we going to have to keep that all this semester? Yeah, sure, that sounds good. I mean, we're not really going to see that mechanism come back again. I think, yeah, at the top of my head, I don't think we're, we do anything more with rabbits, although the halogenation, like radical halogenation, is always going to be a, a, a good uh, synthetic step, right? You know, to add a functional group, right? So in terms of that, definitely keep it in mind, but um, I don't think we're going to see a radical mechanism at the end, uh, specifically. Down to the question. You're waiting on that one for six weeks, right? Like, you're over there at Christmas, like, come on, i got to ask you, right? <laughs> Anything else? Sir? Cool. All right. Well, you guys could you had your chance to stall for uh, stall for time there, but I guess you guys like no, no. We want the we want organic chemistry. Right? All right. Never make it easy, right? All right. Have at it, guys. See what you guys remember. For every question you get wrong, I get to, I have to play the piano. If you don't know, you can play the guitar instead. <laughs> it would not sound good. <laughs> yeah. I'll show I'll show you. Ask me after class. I'll show you. It's a very complex thought process, right? It needs to be done. I'm just kidding. I'll show you. I mean, tell me I'm wrong, though. It, it's an apt name, right? I mean, no, I, yeah. <laughs> I think that should be better than organic chemistry, too. That's yeah, a good point. Like, organic chemistry sounds scary, right? Drawing hexagons, like, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> Crap, a pentagon, I'm going to fail this class. <laughs> no, the real question, or the real struggle would be the pentagon or the hexagon. As with all things in life, practice. Much like the Grinch, my heart grew three times a day. I'm just kidding, I got laid. I'm like, yeah. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> probably Wednesday, that sounds good. A little bit of time in the natural rest of it.
you guys could read the ingredient bottle on here now. Right? It's octal, decil, right? Dimethyl, ammonium, chloride. Right? Yeah, those are words I know. Anyway, I'm distracting you guys from your work. Let me, let me, let me judge partial. Let's see. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> also, nothing. <laughs> no, nothing. Oh, man. This is going to be a long class for you guys. Nothing. Nothing. Now, somebody happened to ask a question about what we need to do here. And Annie asked, well, what do we need to know about? <laughs> That's all I asked. <laughs> What's the problem that we have? Uh, so we start off with just a plain old hexagon, right? Our good old buddy cycle hexagon. You guys remember how to draw chair confirmations? No. <laughs> <laughs> you guys remember axon equatorial? <laughs> right? All this kind of stuff. Right, but we don't have a functional group there, right? So we need to add a functional group. So what's the reaction that we learned on how to add a functional group? Only one of them, and it took a whole chapter to figure it out. A chapter that was quite radical, and let it prove it, let it show you that. That was a hit. <laughs> <laughs> it was subtle, but I worked it in there somehow, right? <laughs> Aha, <laughs> uh -huh, our radical halogenation. Mm -hmm. So if I present something that doesn't have a functional group, right, then we need to add a functional group to it. And one of the, say, perhaps the uh, most studied or maybe what we studied the most in and okay, what at least is what we can do with halogens, right? What can you guys do with a halogen? Can you eliminate it? Sure. Can you substitute it? Sure, right? So we know quite a lot of chemistry that we can do with halogens, so it'd be a good idea to maybe add one there first. How can I do this? Well, I gotta have a halogen source and I gotta give it some energy to form the radicals, right? Good. Now I've got a functional group. Now can you guys turn that into an OH form? Sure. <laughs> well, what do we actually do now? So we've got an alkyl halide, right? We can basically do two things. We can either eliminate or we could substitute, right? What do you guys want to do? Okay, so we want to do a substitution at a secondary leaving group, right? Okay, well, what's our two mechanisms for substitution? SN1 and SN2, okay. So which one's going to be favored at a secondary position?
SN2. Why? What do you mean? I know you've memorized my two smart answers. <laughs> In fact, I think you got a new tattoo too, or upstairs, and then I'll try to She's cheating on the exam. <laughs> what do you mean by stairs, sir? When you told me about Sarah, then you went to make an electronics argument, right? Because you're talking about uh, carbon capture, which is important, right? I'm not saying that you're necessarily right or wrong with that, but we go back to your idea of steroids. What, what, what are, what is steroids? So sterics is how much stuff is there around our leaving group, right? Or our functional group, or whatever it might be, right? Remember, one of those key important things to pay attention to is our functional group, no matter what it is, right? Whether it's an alcohol, or a halogen, or a ketone, or, right? Is it a primary, secondary, or tertiary position, right? That's always one of these key things to pay attention to. So we have a secondary leaving group here, right? Because the bromine, is attached to a carbon, and that carbon is attached to two other carbons, right? So remember, we're always looking at kind of what's what's next door, that kind of that kind of spiel there, right? So what is next door to that red carbon there, right? There's two other carbons there, so a secondary leaving group. So can we do an elimination at a secondary position? You bet. Can we do a, sec a, a, a substitution at a secondary position? I guess we can, okay? So all of our doors are still open, right? We can do a substitution, we can do an elimination, that's fine. But what do we want to do? What does it look like we want to do, I guess I should ask? Okay, so it looks like, let's say that we want to try and do a substitution. What are our two options? SN1 or SN2. Okay, so now let's say I want to do an SN2 at a secondary position. Okay, so what do I need to do an SN2? I need to have a good leaving group. Do I have that? No. Yeah. Yeah. Can I do SN2 in a secondary? Sure. What else do I need? I wanted to make an SN2 happen, what else do I need? Not a strong answer. Somebody else said what? Okay. Is that how SN2s work? A substitute. What's the N in SN stand for? Two. Ah, so what do I need? A good nucleic bond, right? Okay. Well, I need to put an OH there. What's the best nucleophile I can make with, uh, with an OH? I well, to make a good nucleophile, right, I'd have to bring in a functional group with a negative charge, right? You guys get what I'm saying with this? What's a good nucleophile? Something that has a delocalized negative charge, right, that's kind of spread out. A weak base is a very good nucleophile. So is that a good nucleophile? Yes, it actually is, right? But what is it also? A very strong base, okay? So it's going, what's going to be faster, what's going to happen quicker? An acid-base reaction. So here at a secondary position, right? Got a secondary leaving group with a strong base. We're probably going to have a pretty decent mix here of substitution and elimination, right? Will this do substitution? Sure. Will it do elimination? Sure. What's the mix going to be? 50-50-ish maybe, right? Maybe a slight preference for um, uh, elimination, depending, right? You do it a little bit colder, a little bit hotter, some kind of things in there. At the end of the day, we kind of make a mess. 
what we're saying, right? So maybe not the best route. So maybe we can't do SN2 yet, right? Okay, can we do an SN1? Well, do we have a good leading group? Sure. Can we do an SN1 at a secondary position? We can, but what's the problem? Carbocation is going to suck. We make a secondary carbocation. Can we make secondaries? Sure, but they're not very stable. Which means what? Hmm? What do you mean? Like, we're not using the term or all the time. Maybe, right? Maybe, but there's something else. There's something else that's kind of at play here. Isn't it? Go ahead. Ah, okay. So remember, every time that we make a carbocation, we have to pay attention to shifts and rearrangements, all that kind of stuff, right? So fortunately, in this case, we're not going to see any of those, right? Let's see. Can we do a wing expansion or something? We'll come up with something to you know, really lay it on thick next time for you. <laughs> but no, all right, none of that stuff here, right? But we always, that's always something important. Every time we do a car we kind of work for shifts and rearrangements and all these kind of things that can happen, right? Could you do like a pre-post So, so, hang on to that thought. I don't like where you're going, but pause for just a second. I'm doing an SN1 reaction. What does it mean to be a one? What does the one in SN1 mean? Mm hmm? Unimolecular in the rate determining step. Okay, what does unimolecular in the rate determining step mean? Well, that's great. That means it's a step that determines the rate. <laughs> there is only unimolecules. <laughs> right? Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to be unimolecular in the rate determining step? It means the slow step in the mechanism, right? Only has one molecule in there. Okay, fine. What's the rate determining step for any SN1 reaction? Formation of the carbocation. Perfect. Is this going to make a very stable carbocation? No. So what does that tell you about the rate determining step? Extremely slow, right? To the point where if we want to do an SN1 here, you mix the stuff together and you wait, right? And you come back next week, it still hasn't done anything. Like you come back the week after that, and maybe a little bit happened. You come back the week after that, and somebody knocked over your reaction. It's just not going to happen at any practical uh, speed, okay? Can it happen? Sure, right? Because remember, what, what's one of the benefits? Well, you guys are doing chemistry on paper, right? Time isn't really an issue. But it is something to pay attention to, right? Uh, SN1 reaction at a secondary position, extremely slow, right? Extremely slow. Okay, so we can't really do SN2, we can't really do SN1, which then we're in the realm of eliminations, okay? So now, let's see if we can go walk down the path of eliminations. So see what you guys come up with. What do you remember for your eliminations?
one and A2. Okay, cool. So we can automatically throw one of those out. Which one can we throw out? Why can we throw out E1? It's too slow, right, because it has a formation of a carbocation with that, right? So if we couldn't do an SN1, practically speaking, we probably can't do an E1 either. So we can't do E1, we can't do SN1, we can't do SN2, which leaves us with nothing. Go home, right? I'm just kidding. Okay. I got it. All right, so we'll do E2. So what do we need? What's the recipe to make, uh, to do a good um, E2 then? Well, we need a good leaving group, right? Do we have a good leaving group? Sure. Okay. Now we know what flavor of leaving group it is, right? We've got secondary. Okay. What else do we need then? Strong base. Okay. So what could be a strong base? Well, you guys are welcome to pick whatever you want, right? But I think we always kind of there it is. We kind of always uh, used some of these um, O's with negative charges, right? Our, F oxide and ethanol, right? Our acid, Lewis acid base, um, excuse me, Bronsted acid base uh, pairs there, right? F oxide, so the alkoxides in their corresponding alcohols, right? What's up? Like yeah, we could do that too, right? LDA, butoxide, any of those, right? Anything with a strong base. So, What's my next question to be then to you guys? What is a strong base? Okay. A strong base. Is that negative charge localized? How do we know? Well, how do we delocalize things? Spreading it out. Do we have different ways of spreading things out? Sure, right? Resonance, conductive effects, electronegativity, radius, right? All these different things that we talked about in the acid base chapter in OK1, right? You guys all remember those? Extremely important. I told you guys that acid base chapter is probably the most important chapter that you guys take in organic chemistry. Because it all has to deal with looking for charges and how to be stabilized and spread it out and inductive and all that kind of stuff. Okay? That stuff comes up over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Acid base chemistry is one of these foundational steps in all of chemistry. So, we got a strong base, we got a good leaving group, it's secondary, all that kind of stuff, right? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, right, let me grab a hydrogen next door. Take that off. Good. Now we've got a pi bond. What can we do with pi bonds? A lot, right? What do we know about pi bonds? Well, they can act like uh, nucleophiles, right? That's something we learned. Like, yeah, yeah, of course, Dr. H.S. Nucleophiles. What's it mean? <laughs> What's it mean to be a nucleophile? The nuke. Well, that's the nucleus, right? There's some positive stuff there, and then you file something you like, right? So you're going after things with positive charges. Why would a pi bond be a nucleophile? Like that was your answer. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> you just say that. No, no. <laughs> no, that's, that's it, right? How, you know, what? is the only thing in the world that likes positive charges. Electrons, right? 
And we've got a pi bond there, and remember the density, the electron density of a pi bond is above and below the plane. All right, so we've got these pi bonds, excuse me, the electrons that are hanging out above and below the plane. And we, if, we, if they act like a nucleophile, we can turn a pi bond into a sigma bond, which is downhill in energy, right? That's a favorable thing to do, right? So there's a lot of good things that come out of having a pi bond act like a nucleophile, right? So we can do an addition reaction with these, right? We can add things to them. Now, um, I think we'll learn something this semester. Yes, we will. Yes, we will. In fact, I know that. No, I don't know. Right? We will learn how pi bonds can act as electrophiles also. Right? So in some cases, we'll see how pi bonds can act as electrophiles. So if I ask you a question, what's a nucleophile? Well, those are things that like positive charges. And electrophiles are things that like negative charges. Right? So we'll talk a little bit about how pi bonds can behave in that way. In that way. But for the moment, all we really know what to do with them is an addition reaction, okay? Make them act like a nucleophile. So, can I turn an alkene into an alcohol? Yes. How many different ways do you guys know how to do that? At least three, right? Who said what? I heard. Look at you. It was Ian, you called him out. Oh, that was so rude of you. Yes. <laughs> you can sit up here. They're like this. <laughs> right? But we know quite a few different ways of turning an alkene into an alcohol. Now, not all of those different ways are equal, right? We know how to do it through the addition with uh, a, a, a carbocation, right? We can do sumo mechanisms to add them. Right, or oxymercuration, demercuration, right? Yes? What's the benefit of the sumo mechanism? No carbocations, so no rearrangements. Got it? Okay. We know how to do our hydroboration oxidation. What's the benefit of that one? Okay, right, we have anti Markovnikov addition, right? anti markovnikov -Markov addition of an alcohol. Does it matter in this case, though? No, they're both equal. So could you still do the hydroboration here? Sure, right? It's just there's not a less substituted sign, right? So pick your favorite way, and you can get it done in this case, right? Me, I want to save calories until I'll write the least amount that's possible, right? So we can just put a simple acid catalyzed hydration, right? Good? Would that work? Yeah. It would on paper. Right? In reality, we wouldn't want to do it that way, but that's a different argument for a different day. Right? Cool. So, quick question. Serious question. What if I had given you guys that as a quiz today? How would we have done it? Why is that? Yeah. Being honest with you guys, uh, if I can have a little bit of serious talk with you guys. I spent a lot of time teaching you guys at Tim Light, right? I think I, well, I know I did a fantastic job. <laughs> Just said serious, not going to crack a joke in like 30 seconds. <laughs> no, I'm serious, come on. Right? But anyway, in all seriousness, you know, I spent a lot of time, and you guys put a lot of time into it also. I expect you guys to know all about Tim Light, right? That's just the way it is. I don't have time to go back and review it for you guys. I, I, I don't, right? As you guys know, uh, there's, all, there's already a lot of material that we have to cover, and I'm adding on to the stuff that we learned in the first semester there. So things like acids and bases and nucleophiles and additions and all that, right? Definitely stuff that we have to remember. And I think you guys remember more of it than you, know, you might be willing to admit right, at the moment, right? But we do need to go and refresh it a little bit there, right? So I think I posted, like there's a, I think it's like a three hour video, kind of like everything you need to know from OCAM 1 type thing, right? Put it on in the background, put it at two times speed, and just kind of, you know, listen through it as you can, right? And when you get to a point, you're like, uh, I don't remember any of that, then go in and slow it down, right? That kind of thing. But, you know, knock the rust off with these things, because you, you, we, we are going to have to know these things, we are going to have to use these ideas over and over again. Because you remember, I made you guys a promise, right? Do you guys remember what that promise is? Read our shampoo bottles. Yeah, I did. You're right. You are absolutely right. How many of you guys read your shampoo bottles? 
There you go, right? Did you guys did you understand a little bit more of it? Yeah, right? It said water in there. I got it. <laughs> I got that one that great. There's something called fra fragrance. Right? <laughs> right, anyway, right. But uh, anyway, that is one of the promises, and I made you guys another promise, and that said that I would only teach you guys stuff that you would need to know, right? Stuff that you would see over and over again. I'm not going to sit here and just load you guys up with fluff because what's the point with that, right? You guys aren't necessarily chemists, although some of you guys are biochemists, right? But a little bit of a different, you know, a little bit of a different side there, but I promise those things here. I'm not going to teach you guys anything that you don't need. On the other end of that promise, then, I expect you guys to know the stuff that, that we have on the food, right? And I'm, I'm boiling this down as much as I can for you guys, but we do need to uh, make sure that we know this stuff a little bit more. Fair enough? Good? Cool. All right. So now we have our uh, good old buddy, uh, an alcohol there, right? And so if we just put this guy in, let's do this, actually. Start over here. Okay. okay, so then we can start. Uh, we have an alcohol, what do we know about those? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So they can hydrogen bond. Now, where is that important? The answer is everywhere, right? And so, in fact, when I was, when I was uh, starting um, uh, Gen Chem 2 lectures today, right, we started talking about the intermolecular forces. And I told them that the first day of class in OCHEM, I would ask them what the intermolecular forces is, because we'd see them over and over and over and over. And you know what they did? They yawned at them. Because it's an 8 a.m. class, right? So. <laughs> Hey, don't worry, I'll get them yet, right? Um, but anyway, so you know, hydrogen bonding is always something important. We talked about solvent effects when we were talking about slowing down or speeding up SN1 versus SN2 and all these kind of things that went with it, right? So definitely always something uh, useful to pay attention to there is the idea of hydrogen bonding. Okay. What else? Mm -hmm. They're terrible lady groups, right? Alcohols, OHs, O's with a minus charge are terrible leaving groups. Now, we will see an O minus act as a leaving group this semester, but there's something else that's going on behind the scenes, right? So that's something good to remember. Now, as a quick tangent, can we turn an alcohol into a leaving group? Yes, all right? We have a couple different ways of accomplishing that, right? And we'll cover a couple new ones here at the beginning, although some of you guys ran into these already when you were um, uh, last semester, but that's okay. Right? So they are terrible leaving groups, but we can transform them into good leaving groups. What else? Can we have an acidic hydrogen, right? What's the relative pKa of an alcohol? Oh, I should be careful. What is the, let's say, the pKa to a member for an alcohol? 16. About 16 or so, right? So that's pretty good, right? So if you remember about 16, that kind of gives you an idea, right? Although, can we make alcohols more acidic? Sure. Right? Can we make them less acidic? Sure. Right? But pretty good, pretty good kind of group that way. What else? We talked about acids, so it might be good to think about. Right? There's more pairs on the oxygen. Right, remember that alcohols can be amphoteric, right? So they can act as acids and they can act as bases, right? Are they good acids? Is the pKa of 16 a good acid? No. Are they good bases? Not particularly, right? But can they act as acids and bases? Sure. Can an alcohol react with a strong acid? Absolutely, right? Absolutely. Can an alcohol react with a pretty strong base? Absolutely, right? So that's something, those are some important points to remember there. Now we talked about how we can transform an alcohol into uh, a tosylate, right? We put in some tosyl chloride and some pyridine, right? And then it turns into a good leaving group, right? We talked about, did we, remind me, we talked about the, the Trimethyl silo protecting groups, the TMS chloride, did we talk about that? Yeah. 
So I, I think I think you're right. Yeah. So we talked about how we can protect the alcohols, right? So when we have to be careful about what reagents we're adding in there, right? We have our TMS, our tetra, or excuse me, our trimethyl silyl chloride, right? Is a protecting group for our alcohols. That means they're not going to react in the same way. Right, so they're not going to interact as much with the acids and the bases. That's good. But what we're going to talk about now is uh, something we didn't really mention too much in the first semester, although we kind of saw them along the way. Right. So what we're going to talk about first are those. Okay. What's that? You're sitting here, and I like to hang out on the left hand side. Oh, okay. <laughs> Any attention is good, afterwards. You don't understand. <laughs> oh, right? So, we talked a little bit about aldehydes and ketones, right? But here we have an aldehyde, right? How do we know it's an aldehyde? Carbon on one end, hydrogen on the other, right? So, aldehyde. Can you guys make an aldehyde? Yes, you can. One very confident person. All right, Taylor, we're looking at you. How are we going to do it? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's okay. The answer is true, right? You guys did learn how to make an aldehyde. It was a kind of a roundabout method here, right? And the way we kind of learned how to do it is if we had, let me grow this a little bit better. Oh, the fork went out. I already gave you guys a hint. So, I used to bring a bag of Jolly Ranchers and send it back to you guys. Right? Like if you'd say something like, oh, that was like, well, who's got the answer? <laughs> 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 right? <laughs> but then apparently it wasn't like they, they forbid us to give out candy and stuff at other schools, so it's kind of a habit. But, uh, so we have a terminal alkyne, right? And you remember that something weird, uh, maybe not, I shouldn't say weird, I should be careful. Something unique happened when we dealt with the uh, addition of alcohols to alkynes. Right? So we remember that if we, uh, let me go give myself a little bit more space. So BH3, right? THF, we come in with some sodium hydroxide. So if we're doing our, hang on just a second before you guys copy down everything, right? So if we're doing our hydroboration oxidation, right, we add the alcohol. Let me put some color in here real quick, right? So there's the blue, the red, right? So we add our alcohol to the uh, less substituted side, right? But what did we say happens from this point? Right, we have an alcohol attached to an alkene. Right? This was a question on your guys' final exam, right? I believe, if I remember correctly. Does oxygen always just one have two bonds? Ah, right, so hang on to that thought. Yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll talk, that's going to be very important in just a minute, right? But remember, when you see an alcohol coming off of an alkene, it's going to tautomerize, right? So it's going to be a tautomerization, wherein what we will actually end up with is this, right? H. Okay. Can't stop it from happening. Now, you'll notice my arrow in pink. Does it look a little bit fuzzy, or is that just my worsening eyesight? Where am I going to do it anyway? Go up there and adjust the focus. No, seriously, the focus is up there. That's useful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jose, 
you're the tallest guy here. Sorry. <laughs> Get on Ian's shoulders and adjust the photos. Right? <laughs> anyway, I don't know. Maybe this, but maybe it's just me. But right, we can't really stop this categorization from happening. So we will never end up with a double bond and an OH coming off of it. It's just going to instantly tautomerize over. Okay? Now it is an equilibrium, and what do we mean by that? It can go back and forth. It's just one side of this equilibrium is very heavily favored. The carbonyl side, the aldehyde side, is way, 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 way more favored than the um, the eme all. Right, so the enol, right, so the alkene with the alcohol, the enol side. However, the reason why I'm mentioning it here is because we're going to be able to use that enol chemistry in the upcoming chapters. Right, so when I said we're going to spend about four chapters dealing with carbonyls, making an enol and then reacting it is going to be something that we see quite frequently. In fact, it's going to be a useful, um, I want to put, I guess intermediate would be the appropriate appropriate term here. Right, that enol, that, uh, that transient enol intermediate there is going to be useful for us to do something. So I need you guys to remember about the tautomerization. All right? Can you guys do the mechanism to do that tautomerization? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I do it? Is that what you're asking? Of course I can. That's not going to help you guys, is it? So let me help you guys out a little bit here, right? So let's just simplify for just a little bit and let's see what you guys come up with, right? All right, so ignoring the other things in there, sort of, here's what I'm asking you to do. In the presence of a base, right, and we have some water, can you guys show me how to get from one side to the other, okay? Now, before you guys get started, Right before I launched into this spiel about um, alcohols, excuse me, I drew you guys the first alcohol, and what did, I, what did we spend time doing? What are the properties of them, right? And so think about the properties when you come up with a mechanism for this here, okay? So see what you guys come up with. You guys can do a real quick mechanism. So the tautomerization. Yes, three arrows, right? One, two, three, four, excuse me, four arrows. Just don't forget to make a bond and then.
<laughs> yep. Got to do something. What's that? Go ahead. Base. Is it a good base? Yes. You bet. How do good bases want to act? Like a base. Like a base. Okay? And if you're a base, what are you on the hunt for? I'm going to ask you, do we have something somewhat acidic in there? Sure. What do we have? An alcohol. Right? Can alcohols act like uh, acids? According to Dr. H, they can, right? Dubious source. Good. Anything unusual about this? Acid base chemistry? Right, not too bad. Now what? That's the problem we have to fix. We got a charge, right? Can we stabilize that charge in some way? Sure. Okay. We can stabilize it by turning a lone pair into a pi bond and turning a pi bond into a lone pair, right? Also known as a resonance structure. So let's do that. minus charge, darn powerful base, right? Do we have something that can give it a proton or anything? Sure, what do we have around? One, got it? So, the one last acid base, under acidic conditions. Yes, Dr. H. <laughs> okay. Remember we're under basic conditions. What charges are there around? Oh, wait, sorry. I thought we meant, never mind. I'm going to talk to you Okay. So, what if it's not positive charges? <laughs> <laughs> what charges do we have around? Negatives, right? So if you're under basic conditions, making another negative is not a big deal. 
right? Very, very, very rarely will you ever see a full positive form under, a, under basic conditions. Can it happen? Yes. But there needs to be a good reason for it to happen. More often, you're looking to make more negatives. You trade one negative for another. That's all it comes down to. Under acidic conditions, things are positive. So you end up making more positives, right? Very, very rarely will you see a negative form under a completely acidic condition for everything else is positive. Got it? Which is not very good conditions. Oh, yeah. This happens under any conditions. Like you, you really can't stop it. Because even in like pure water, where there's just a little bit for enough of the acid baseline for this to happen. You can trap the enol if you uh, uh, put the protecting group right. You can actually stop this if you put the trimethyl silo in there and kind of stop the acid base part from happening. Um, and that's actually, yeah, there's a set of reactions. I don't think we'll work that, but that is something you can do. Right? It might even be in the book. But, so you can stop it, but you need special conditions. Uh, you can you can stop it when you need special conditions. Under just regular, just acid or base with an alcohol, it's going to immediately go over to the tonic Okay. Cool. All right. So it looks like uh, we've got a clock that works in here, though, which is an upgrade from. <laughs> okay. uh, but we'll pick this back up and we'll continue working through uh, a little bit of our carbon and that kind of stuff. Okay. We will see you guys on uh, Wednesday. Wednesday.